Greetings, my name is Vincent, and in this episode, let's paint some more obscure Forge World resin here at Bunker 6. The models will be painted as closely as possible to the original box art seen here. Due to the noxious fumes of the type of primer that I used for my terrain pieces, they were sprayed off camera. The first thing I wanted to do was add some tonal differences to the concrete, so I just added a slightly darker grey directly over the top of the grey primer. Once the darker tone was finished, I moved on to doing the complete opposite, which was a light dry brush. Bearing in mind, all of these layers are going to be covered in an oil wash, so theoretically this is a pre-highlight before a shade goes over the top but it is a transparent shade and a majority of that oil wash will be rubbed off so these shades and highlights will cut through then i just added the very simple step of a base color to all of the rivets surrounding the barricade this was as much painting as i wanted to do before i covered all of this with an oil wash so before you do an oil wash you're going to have to lay down some gloss varnish or in this case semi-gloss varnish to seal all of your previous work in place before adding any oils. The most important thing to consider when doing oil washes is the consistency of the oils to the thinners that you're going to be using. I like to try and do a 70-30 mix and making sure that I don't put so much oil on that there's a lot pooling in places that will take a very long time to dry. The oil washes on all of the models were applied light enough that with just a little bit of hair drying I managed to get all of them dry within about 20 minutes each, which is fantastic which means I could just carry on working straight over the top of the oil wash. The next stage was to do the cleanup of the oil wash. Now you can use different tools, you can use brushes, you can use sponges, you can use q-tips, and I do use a variety of these tools as I go through the video. The tool that you use depends on the kind of finish and effect that you want from the oils being removed, and also just in case you've got like a tight spot or something like that, maybe you can't use a sponge and you'll have to use something more narrow like a paintbrush. But the wonderful thing about doing these oil washes is it's so flexible. If you make a mistake, you just reapply the oil and try it again. You can do this as many times as you want. Once I was happy with the cleanup of the oils, I moved on to sealing all of that work with a matte varnish. Bringing down that sheen and luster of the oils makes everything sit back in its place and look much more natural. The oil wash, of course, was to create a nice amount of depth, add some grime and dirt in all of the crevices. Problem is, that dulls down the entire model. So now we've got to go back in and start adding some additional highlights here and there to bring up some of the bright end of the saturation and make things have a bit more energy again. The reason why I'm doing the highlights with edge highlighting rather than with dry brushing is because I don't want the dry brushing to go over the rivets I've painted got a lot more control with edge highlighting. Admittedly, I'm not going to have the same amount of texture as you get with dry brushing, but I think that's a good trade-off considering there's already quite a lot of texture present under the oil washes from earlier steps. This is a simple but slightly tricky step because it does take some time. All we're doing here is adding some black line work in the nooks and crannies and crevices and around the brass rivets. This will just give the model a bit more definition, and instead of just having a murky brown tide line from the oil wash around certain areas, we've got this sharp black line just to make things pop a little bit more. An additional step that was taken with the black paint while I had it out was to cover some of the highlights with this black paint to imply some deeper chipping and some gashes that were in the concrete, especially near the top, where I'm assuming debris would potentially be hitting it. I then tackled the highlighting of the rivets, very simple step, just doing the same thing as before but just with a little less paint on my brush because we still want to have some of that previous murky brass cutting through and the gold just being the tippy top of each rivet to give the impression of a highlight. And that's how I would paint a barricade. Let's move on to the crate. If we're going to recreate the rusty finish of the crate from the box art, we first need to lay down some colours that imply rust. We're going to be using a chipping medium, and the way that works is you're going to have to put down some base colours first before applying the chipping medium. 
so let's go with Rhinox Hide. To really sell the rust effect, we're going to have to use some kind of orangey brown paint, and so we're going to be applying that in patches around the crate. We don't need to cover the entirety of the Rhinox Hide, because when the chipping medium paint is chipped off, we want it to look like there is random and sporadic different types of rust happening all over the crate to give it a more natural appearance. I then liberally added some gloss varnish. I decided to not use the airbrush in this instance because I wanted to make sure this stuff went on really thick first time because I wasn't particularly sure how the chipping medium was going to react. Once the varnish was dry, I then laid the chipping medium down with an airbrush. I decided to use an airbrush just so I had a bit more control and things came out flat and even. Now I've read online that the thicker that you put the chipping medium down, the larger the chips will be and they're easier to chip too, whereas the thinner the chipping medium goes down, the smaller the chips are and the harder it is to chip the paint. I haven't tried the smaller chips, but the big chips work just fine with the brushes that I had at hand. The last step that we have to take on before we can start chipping away at this paint job, quite literally, is add our final top color, which goes over the chipping medium. This final color is going to be the color that is actually chipped away from the model, exposing the previous layers of rust that we did earlier on. I then approached the chipping stage with some mild apprehension, but I found that the best tool to do the job was the one that you see right here. Now you can use things like toothbrushes or stiff old paintbrushes, but just because these bristles are so hard and sharp, with just a little bit of water applied to the paint job, this did a fantastic job of delivering the idea that these chips were really happening on the model. One thing I will say is less is more with all of this chipping stuff. Do not go in all guns blazing. You want to be light at first, if you can even. Try and use a test piece of material where you've done the same paint process, but just have a practice object that you can start scraping away at before working on the actual model that you're trying to do a good job with. Now, one thing to bear in mind when I was doing this, I had visualized the whole time the original box art as well. There seemed to be a lot of chipping going on in the top two left and right ridges of the crate. So I tried to emulate that. And that really helped me with my confidence with the chipping because I had a goal of what the chipping should look like rather than just going in blind. There's one thing that I'm a little bit regretful for, and I should mention it because this is supposed to be a painting tutorial. I would recommend rinsing off some of the residue paint that can be left behind that has been chipped off of the model. I didn't do that because I didn't particularly notice it at the time, but when I finally got around to doing playback of the footage, I did notice this sort of sludgy residue that was sitting in some of the crevices. I would recommend rinsing that off if you can, but also be very cognizant that you could run the potential risk of pulling off more of that chipping medium, which you may not want to do. Once the model had finished drying, due to the moisture that was having to be added to activate the chipping medium, the model was sealed with ultra matte varnish. The first thing that I did with the earth was to make sure that the darkest part of the earth was sitting around the crate itself. As we can see, the crate is supposed to be rusting, it's almost sinking into its environment. So I wanted to imply that that rust was continuing into the earth itself. So that's why we use that dark brown. I then used scrag brown to create a lighter tone, a bit further away from the crate, to add variation and to make the model stand out more. Because if everything was dark, then it doesn't really look particularly impactful. But creating that contrast draws the eye more into the center of the model with its dark and dense colors and tones. I then added a couple of patches of a light gold brown paint. Not really trying to do too much here, just want to add a little bit of tonal variation in the highlights before we add the shade over the top. This will hopefully make things look a little bit more interesting here and there. Now let's zoom into some of the junk and detritus that is spilling out of this dilapidated crate. I'm not sure if these are bricks or cartons of some kind, but they look like they've been painted in a sort of cement gray, so I'm assuming they're some type of barricade or brick, and that's what we're going to be painting them like. The only thing I wanted to do before we moved on to painting the gray tones and the metallic barrel 
was blocking everything out in black paint first. There's two reasons for that. One, I really do prefer having greys and stuff being painted up from a black layer. And secondly, I also just wanted to make sure that I had some of those black parts already blocked in so I didn't have to add them later around the greys. I knew that I was going to be wanting to cover all of this stuff in Agrax Earthshade a little bit further down the road, so I wanted to add some blue tones rather than just going straight in with grey, just so there was a teeny bit more visual interest in the otherwise dull grey bricks that are falling out of the crate. It's very subtle, barely noticeable, but to me it just made me feel a little bit more satisfied than just only going in with a grey and a highlight. Once the bricks were finished, I then just painted the barrel at the back the silver colour that appeared in the box art. Now this was a very satisfying step because this Agrax Earthshade is going to make sure that the inside of the crate and the ground feel as one rather than two separate entities. I even added some of the Agrax Earthshade in over the top of the crate just to add a little bit more cohesion between everything as well. I just wanted to bring the barrel back out a little bit by adding some highlights to it, just so it didn't feel like it completely disappeared after the Agrax Earthshade wash. Now you don't have to do this step if you want to completely emulate the box art, but I just like to add my own little touch here and there sometimes. All I've done is split an army painter wasteland tuft in half with a pair of scissors and added the two split halves in a couple of different places on the model. This is just to make the crate feel like it's really settled into its environment and just a little bit more realistic. Now it's just a case of adding a few little highlights here and there to the earth that's around the crate. We're being very sporadic here and trying to be as random as possible because we don't want it to look like there's uniformity in such a chaotic scene. The final highlight that's going to be added to the earth is going to be this ivory. Now we've got to be very, very, very sparing with this because we don't want it to look like chalk or something like that. So we're just making sure that we're not going too hard and heavy with the paintbrush. We also don't want to create paint strokes that's going to look really bad. So just choosing some select areas around the model and dotting this here and there. One thing that felt very appropriate for this particular model was adding some rust pigment. So I've pulled out some very specific rust pigment that's called Fresh Rust and just applied it very sparingly here and there. And I think this really is the final step that sells the idea that this crate has crashed and rusted in this big pile of dirt over many years. And then we just had to seal all the pigment and all that work and make sure that, that Agrax overshade is no longer shiny with some matte varnish. With the crate finished, I turned my attention to the turbine. This is quite an interesting model and I'm actually using it as some kind of a roundabout on my actual board rather than a piece of factory equipment because it looks quite nice. Now this is going to be quite similar to how we painted the barricade. We're going to be doing some highlights and some shading before we lay down the oil wash. These things are going to cut through the oil wash later on, so let's get on with that. We're going to be doing the soot and dust build up with this London grey first, just to give the idea that obviously this has been sitting in a dusty, murky environment. And then we're going to be adding some highlights to add some tonal variation to this otherwise quite grey model. One additional stage I wanted to do before I added the oil wash was have this copper or brass tip of the turbine laid down just so it sat back a little bit once the oil wash was applied. And before we add the oil wash, as always, we've got to seal the previous work first. So we're going to do that with some semi-gloss varnish. Unlike the barricade, this turbine had plenty of little places where the oil could accumulate, so I had to be very cognizant of how I was applying the oil, making sure that I wasn't leaving too much left in the corners. The cleanup phase was the longest phase of this paint job, which is ironic because I'm not painting anything at this point. But the most important thing with something like this, which is a very symmetrical object, is to make sure that all the cleanup is even. If things don't look particularly even, it can look 
immediately disjointed and sort of take you out of the immersion of the object. So when I cleaned up one area, I made sure that all the other areas matched. Now there were some really tricky parts that I couldn't really do very well, such as the archways on the edge of the model, because I couldn't get a cotton bud in there or a sponge, so I actually ended up having to go in with a paintbrush and some thinners. You can see that I'm getting some of the oil out here, but otherwise, apart from the stuff in the middle of the arches, nothing else was coming out. So you have to be patient, take your time, and not just ram your Q-tip into a model. Sometimes you have to just bite the bullet and pull out the paintbrush and do it the long and hard way. Now the Q-tip is very useful for flat areas like this. I just had to make sure that I didn't go too crazy with my thinners, because if I have too many thinners down on the model, then you're gonna start dislodging oil where you actually want to keep it. My apologies, I did not record myself spraying the model in ultra matte varnish, but I'm sure you can fill in the gaps there. But as you can see, what I'm doing next is focusing in on this brown rim that's sitting at the bottom of the turbine that is very, very brown in the original box art as well. So we're just going to emulate that with a few different brown tones. And just to give it a little bit of uniformity and pull all those different brown tones together, we're going to add a filter of Agrax Earthshade. Now this is a step that definitely wasn't done on the original artwork, but I preferred my version because I wanted it to look a little bit more dirty and rugged around the edges. Just to bring a bit more vibrance and texture back to the turbine, we're going in with a little bit of dry brush with the ivory paint. We're not going pure white. I don't really like to go pure white anymore these days. Ivory is such a nice, subtle version of white. It does the same job, but it doesn't stand out compared to the rest of the paint job. Especially when you have something that's murky and dirty like this, you don't want to go too bright and make things look unrealistically clean. One of the more simple jobs was to go around and paint all of the rivets on this turbine. Just make sure that the paint is running off of the paintbrush smoothly and don't press down too hard, otherwise you're going to have gold paint where you don't want it. One of the simplest tasks on the paint job was followed up by one of the most irritating parts of the paint job, which was going around all of the areas that required some brown line work. Now, it doesn't sound like too much of an issue, and as you can see, doing this cone is just one straight line, but doing all of the rivets can be a real pain. But one thing I learned recently that changed this a little bit for me was if you apply a little bit of moisture around the rivet, then paint onto that moistened surface, you do get a little bit of capillary action and the paint will flow a little bit easier around said rivets. I've just always had an issue painting tight circles like this. I always end up making mistakes and going off outside of where I need to be painting. But that moisture technique definitely helped me somewhat and it may help you too. And once the final gold highlights were added, the model was complete. Thank you so much for watching until the end of the episode. That was the Adeptus Titanicus terrain set of turbines, crates, and barricades. We have one more set to get through in the form of silos, and I'll be doing that in the next episode. If you learned something, maybe consider subscribing if you're new here. And if you're already subscribed, thank you so much for your ongoing support. Much appreciated. And until next time, I'm Vincent, signing off from here at Bunker 6. Bunker 6.